I'll make up an answer and we'll get those uh, answers <laughs> for you. That's another good way to do it. But I mostly wanted to say thank you for, for checking this out today and being patient with me while I learn how to do this. But the museum is really happy to share that we have been able during these trying times to still be available for research and for managing the artifacts up here at the collections. Um, being a very small volunteer crew, we're able to uh, still um, touch base in here one at a time without um, interfering with each other. But we're really proud of the work that's been done on the website by our volunteer, Carol. Um, and I hope you can check that out because it's got some new uh, sites on it and uh, new access to some of the history that our um, collection manager, Heather, is making available. But I especially want you to um, check out and consider looking at the benefits of becoming a member. Membership is the most important thing to the Marin History Museum. We depend on that membership to keep us going. You can, again, contact info at marinhistory.org um, or our website to look for the membership applications. And even better yet, follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want to keep up to date with uh, daily history insights on Marin County history. But first, before I introduce our, our guest speaker tonight, I want to really thank the volunteers and staff that helped pull this together, especially my fellow Elkette Costanza. She Hi, really, everybody. really saved us. Otherwise, you would be watching Marcy's tech show, as I'm sure <laughs> some of you have seen and or not seeing Zoom if we didn't have Costanza. Carol has been very patient with me teaching me how to uh, use the laptop to get this going. And then the background support of Ann, Heather, and Lane were uh, really good and encouraging. And of course, I got to thank the Elks Lodge for doing the promotion for this and helping in all the support that they do. And we're looking forward to getting back there. And possibly Jeff will be our first live person so we can go hang out in the bar with Jeff. So now let me introduce that guy, Jeff Burkhart. You probably know him as Barfly. He's got an article in the IJ Weekly, so you want to go check that out, too, because it's really entertaining. And he might even talk about you if he's ever seen you in his bar. <laughs> um, he did a presentation for us a couple years ago on his first book, 20 Years Behind Bars. And now, I, I hope it hasn't been 20 more years. Next book is 20 Years Behind Bars, No Parole. But when he did one that first talk for us, he did it about the Rafael Hotel, can you see this book here? We sell this book here at the Marin History Museum, $15. It's about the history of cocktails at the Rafael, it's called the American Bartender Clubman Mixologist. It cost 50 cents in 1891. So it's not too much more than that. But you might, <laughs> you can contact me at info at marinhistory.org and I can hook you up with that book. So remember, go to the bottom of the screen, hit the chat, chat box, go to everyone questions, type those in. I see there's a whole bunch already starting, so I need to catch up there. I'm going to give this over to Jeff. Here's Jeff. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Marin History Museum has always been a, a great guest or a great uh, host for me. Uh, I've had a number of events there. It's been great fun. Uh, the first one, as Marcy mentioned, was my first book, which was 20 Years Behind Bars. And my second one, Parole Denied, Volume 2 just came out. Both are available on Amazon. I would appreciate it if you get those. They're available free right now uh, uh, if you subscribe to one of Amazon services. I also do a podcast for, on iTunes called the Barfly Podcast, plus my, my Barfly columns and the Sunday paper. And then I do an every other uh, week column uh, on, on products and, and product-related uh, things in the IJ, the Zest section, every other Wednesday. So as a bartender, people always tell me stories. And I love people, and I love their stories which is one of the reasons I started writing the Barfly column in the first place. One story that really inspire, inspired me involved a couple late one night. After a long dinner, the, couple, the man and the couple pointed at an objective door at the back of our little bar. Now the place I work at is over 80 years old. And he said, in a, in a, it said with some authority, did you know that used to be a window and that during prohibition, they used to sneak alcohol through it. I mentioned that I worked there for almost a decade and that perhaps, just perhaps, maybe, that story wasn't entirely true. He insisted. I know it for an absolute fact, he said. I didn't have the heart to tell him the two things that I knew for absolute facts. One, that the decorative door used to be the working back door on the building, as evidenced by every picture hanging in the building. And two, and perhaps most importantly, that building had been built in 1937, which is four years after Prohibition ended. But you know, they say, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. 
So after starting the adventure that began with Barfly and has been continuing with those two books and the podcast, I discovered some real actual yeah, facts. I discovered some real actual facts about Boos and Marin County. Going way back, we were told that Sir Francis Drake landed in Marin County in 1579. But did you know Drake is also reputed to be the inspiration for the Mojito? The story goes that while besieging Havana, his crew became sick and relieved their symptoms by mixing their rum with a native concoction of lime, mint, and sugar, christening it the El Drake. Over 150 years later, Ignacio Pacheco, whose parents came to San Francisco in 1776, founded the ranch in 1840 that would eventually become the city of Nevada in, 18, in 1840. Uh, um, sorry, his, his, and his descendants still live here and make a fabulous Cabernet on the oldest vines of Marin County, incorporating some of their original mission grapes. Check it out, Pacheco Ranch, right there off of Highway 101 in Ignacio. We also know that Cocktail Boothby, the book that you were shown, one of the most famous bartenders of San Francisco's so-called golden age of bartending, wrote his most famous book, The World's Drinks and How to Mix Them, not while working in, the San, in San Francisco, but rather while presiding over the bar at the Hotel Rafael. The hotel used to be located in the Dominican area and once served as an emergency hospital during the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918 before it burned down in 1928. The only remnants of the hotel are two brick pillars off of Grand Avenue and Boothby, Boothby's book. Then there was the American Distilling Company in Sausalito, one of the few distilleries that actually survived prohibition, and they did it by making medicinal whiskey. But the distillery just exploded in fire in 1963, causing the most ever property damage in Sausalito's history, equal to at least $5 million in today's money. One can only guess what the amount of property damage would be in today's money. Ironically, that site is now the home of the Whiskey Springs Condominium. And finally, there are two tidbits from the 1970s, including the invention of the Tequila Sunrise at the Trident Restaurant in Sausalito and the bottling of the first ever vintage port in California by Woodbury Winery in 1977 in San Rafael. This is an actual bottle of that first vintage port ever, ever bottled, unsealed, no party. But enough with the dry history lesson. Let's get on to the wet part. Today I'm gonna to make three cocktails for you, all with local history and all with local ingredients. Since we've already talked about the drink, it makes sense to make it. So I'm gonna make a mojito. And for this mojito, I'm gonna use um, Batiste Echo Positive Rum, spelled R-H-U-M, made in the Caribbean, but finished here in Northern California using rye barrels from Moylan's Distillery. Batiste is, is the French privateer version of an English privateer's rum. Or as I like to say, drum might have brought Marin the rum, R-U-M, but Batiste has brought us the rum, R-H-U-M. The difference being that English rum is made from leftover molasses, while French rum is purpose made from pure sugar cane juice. So we're gonna start off with a mojito. You wanna get yourself a mixing glass? Now, one of the things about a mojito most people do is they muddle the mint. That is not the way to make a mojito. I'll show you the simpler one. Fill your glass with ice. Add an ounce and a half of rum. Add about three quarters of an ounce of fresh squeezed lime juice. Always use fresh squeeze. It's the best way to do it. Then we're going to use simple syrup. Simple syrup is really just sugar that's diluted with water. It's 50-50 brought to a boil. This is already pre-made. You can use sugar, but sugar doesn't readily dissolve in alcohol. And you'll find little bits of sugar in your drink if you do that. So we're going to add three quarters of an ounce of that. Then we're going to, I have spearmint at my house, so I'm going to use spearmint. Take a few leaves, tear them up gently, and put them on top. No muddling. And, oops, don't forget all your tools. Get your shaking glass, shake it just to combine. You can smell it. It's got a beautiful uh, aromatic thing because herbs don't need to be uh, pulverized. They just need to have their juices released. Add a little more ice. Top with some sparkling water. Give it a stir. Whenever you add an ingredient that you haven't shaken, you want to stir it. And then garnish with a lime wheel and a sprig of fresh mint. That is an El Drac or a mojito. Delicious, refreshing, and wonderful. The other thing about a mojito is you don't necessarily need to use mint. 
You could use thyme, you can use cilantro, you can use a lot of different things. Essentially a liquor, a citrus juice, a sugar, and an herb, and you'll be able to mix a wonderful refreshing drink. So that's the Eldrop. The next drink I'm gonna make was invented by Bobby Loza at the Trident restaurant in Sausalito in the early 1970s and passed on to Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones, who then took it on tour with his band in 1972, actually nicknaming that tour the Cocaine and Tequila Sunrise Tour, which I documented for the very first time in a story I wrote for National Geographic. The original Sunrise was a five ingredient drink. Eventually it was reduced to just three ingredients, but Bobby Lozoff's original is the best, and that's the one I'm gonna make. For that, I'm gonna use Cinco Centenados. This is actually not tequila, this is mezcal, but mezcal or tequila work fine in this drink. Mezcal is gonna give it a little more of that smoky punch. This is owned by Joseph Gilbert, who's the son of one of my neighbors up here in Nevada. So we're gonna start off by building it in the glass. Add ice. So the thing about a sunrise is you wanna build it in order. You don't wanna mix it. That's kind of the trick of the sunrise. So you're gonna add an ounce and a half of tequila. You're gonna add about three quarters of an ounce. A fresh squeezed orange juice, again, fresh is always best. Three quarters of an ounce of fresh squeezed lime juice. And then a flash of cassis. And a splash of grenadine. So orange, lime, cassis. Cassis, what's that? But if you notice, it has this wonderful color effect from down at the bottom. Beautiful. Just a beautiful drink and incredibly refreshing. Almost like a cross between a margarita and a, and a yeah, tequila. Yeah, un unfortunately, we're, we're getting some interference from somebody who's not muted. And we might have missed some of what you just did. Okay, I can, I can redo it. Easy enough. Let's do that. Totally. <laughs> the beauty of live uh, Zoom, right? So again, fill your glass with ice. And I'm using uh, Cinco Centidos, which is a mezcal, not a tequila. You can use either. This is made by uh, 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 Joseph Gilbert, uh, the son of a friend of mine here in Nevada. So we're gonna add a shot of that. So one and a half ounces. Then three quarters of an ounce, maybe an ounce of lime juice. Three quarters of an ounce to an ounce of orange juice. Some of this is dependent on the size of the glass. And then grenadine. This is real grenadine from Sonoma Syrups. This is not that, that cooling uh, sugary stuff that you get. A little splash down the center. And a little cassis, which gives it a little bitter fruitiness. We're going to garnish it with an all-natural maraschino cherry. And what you end up with is this beautiful sunrise effect. Just a beautiful drink, very delicious. If you like margaritas, you're going to love this. And if you like mezcal, this is a good way to give this drink a big punch because mezcal is really a smoky flavor. So that's the two there. So the, I, like I was saying, this, uh, uh, the, the, the Sunrise is actually a type of slink, which is a type of drink that includes a citrus juice, a liquor, and a fruit syrup. In the case of the, the, the tequila Sunrise, the syrup is the cassis, the liquor is the tequila, and then the citrus juice is orange and, and lemon. But there's a, uh, the original slink was quite a bit different. It was just sugar and liquor. And it was also known differently, uh, by a different name. Well, it later became known by a different name. They added bitters to it and called it a bittered slink. Now, you've probably never heard of that drink, but you've, I'm sure you've had one because it's known by a, uh, by a more famous name called the Old Fashioned. And that's the classic Old Fashioned drink, which is just a derivative of a sling. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to use a little bit of that same simple syrup. Again, 50% water, 50% sugar. We're going to add about three quarters of an ounce of that. And then I'm going to use King Floyd's bitters. King Floyd's is out of Novato. They make a, a wonderful orange bitters and a wonderful aromatic bitters. So you wanna put in a couple of splashes of both. We're not gonna muddle any fruit in this. What's gonna happen is the orange bitters is gonna give it that orange rindy flavor, uh, flavor that you're used to. So we've got the sugar, the bitters in there. So now we need the whiskey. 
So with old fashioned, you want to add a good two ounces of whiskey. And the thing about uh, Manhattan and old fashions is you hear you don't want to shake them. And the reason you don't want to shake them is because bitters foams up. And what happens is the drink looks rather unappealing. So typically Manhattans and, and old fashions are stirred, not shaken. That doesn't mean they taste better that way. It just means they look better. And, and uh, we all drink with our eyes first before we drink with our, 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 our mouths. So it's important that it looks visually beautiful, just like glassware. Two ways to really make a, dr a drink pop are good glassware and good garnishes. Otherwise, drinking something out of a plastic cup with a wooden toothpick is one of the most disappointing things you can do. Okay, so we got all our ingredients in here. We're gonna add the ice. We're gonna give it a little stir. I like to stir it with a smaller because it seems to work better with, with the ice. It's funny that way, but I like to do that. And for this drink, I made an ice cube, large format ice cube, where I froze the maraschino cherry in. So that's gonna be our ice cube. Gonna strain the drink over top of it. And add a little orange wedge, which I don't have. And that is a bitter sling or a ring old fashioned. So you can do several different things. You can not use the large format ice. It's just a visual thing. You can use different types of bitters. You can use different types of liquors. You could use tequila, rum, uh, cognac, brandy, anything will work with a combination of bitters and sugar and make a wonderful drink. So there you have three simple uh, Marin County drinks, all made with local products. Again, the Cinco, uh, Cinco Centinos, the Batiste Rum, the Hansons, which Hansons opened a tasting room in Sausalito. It's not open right now, obviously, because of COVID, but it will be open soon. It's right downtown in the old Hansons Gallery, which they, they still operate in conjunction. And then, like I said, King Floyd's makes a wonderful business. So as a little added bonus for people who tuned in today, uh, I had an interesting experience about two years ago when my first book came out. I had a dear friend of mine brought a friend of hers to a party I was having at my house. And the gentleman turned out to be a filmmaker. And he asked me, uh, he had read my book and loved it and said, would you mind if I made a story or made a film out of one of your stories? And I said, no, that would be great. So I gave him permission, he sent me a script, and then I didn't hear from him, from him for a very long time. And so I kind of forgot about the whole thing. I mean, in my industry, bartending, people come and tell you things all the time, and some of it comes to fruition and some of it doesn't. So about a year ago, I got a call from this gentleman and uh, he said that the film was, was gonna be made. And uh, he, he wanted uh, some help on a few things. And, uh, and I was very excited. On the same day, coincidentally, I got a call from my daughter, who's an, L, uh, an actress in LA, saying that she had to come up to San Francisco because she had an audition for a part being filmed, uh, for a film being filmed in Marin County. Turned out that part was for the film that uh, Robin Lee made about my story. So in the most ironic situation, my daughter ended up getting cast in a movie that I wrote the story about. And as a great treat, Robin has a, a graciously allowed us to give you guys a sneak peek of that video, of that film today via the Zoom presentation. So I certainly hope you like it. It's called Testing One, Two, Three, and it's from my uh, first book. Great, and here we go. And I wanna note that it was, um... It was released on June 6, 2020, so it's really new. It should, yeah, it's, this is a private a, a event so that it, it, it won't be available after this until the film festivals in the fall, hopefully at the Mill Valley Film Festival. I'm pulling it up now. Uh-oh, can see all your desktop. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so you can see it, so you don't see only horses. Oh, wait, wrong one. Okay, here we go. There we go. Oh, here we go. Oh, hidden. One second.
There we go. There we go. Okay, it's called Testing One, Two, Three. It was released on, oh, I was wrong, June 15th, 2020. Here yeah. we go. Um, and you might want to turn on the speakers. You might want to turn up the speakers on your laptop, iPad to hear it. Here we go. So many such tests, it's a wonder my wife keeps administering them. Her preferred vehicle for gauging my attention seems to be coffee. Every six months or so, she changes the exacting way she takes her caramel colored caffeinated beverage. It was a double decaf Americano with just a touch of water. Then it was a half cast soy latte, and currently, she seems to favor just a regular decaf coffee with a touch of soy creamer. At least I think that's what it is. At any rate, I've stood in line in many a coffee shop, racking my brain for this week's convoluted concoction, only to fail once again. Is this French roast? Regular the creamer? It's wine. She's been drinking white wine. She'll have a glass of white wine. What kind of white wine? I'm not sure. I, I didn't recognize any of the ones on your list. Maybe I can help. Just toss out the name of some wine she wants. Uh, Edith something. Eden. No. It was from California, somewhere down south. Was it in the valley? That's it. We don't carry that. But I 
do have something like it. And what have you boys been talking about? He was just telling me how much you like it in the Valley Chardonnay. Is this a glass of it? No, but it's the next best thing. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. You know, Jeff, I got to know how many times you've pulled that off. <laughs> I've done that a lot. The funny thing was they actually, uh, Robin asked me to read for the part of the bartender, which of course is me, right? And uh, the, the feedback was I was unconvincing in the role, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> And then when I, I, obviously I'm in the cameo, I'm the barista at the, at the coffee shop. And uh, his only direction to me was, okay, let's try it now without you talking, which I thought was hilarious. So my daughter is the hostess there, which is, uh, which uh, she did a great job, I thought. And uh, it was just, it was a wonderful experience to, to have all that come together. And I think Robin did a great job. Jumped a little bit around on, on Zoom because of the, the, the mix of the two technologies. But uh, I was really pleased with what it, how it came out. I also thought it represents a period that we can't see right now. All those things that you take for granted in that video or in that film can't happen right now. And so it's kind of a nostalgic look at something that I, I think will come back, but it, it, it's going to be a little while. So it's a lighthearted look at the way things used to be and the way things will be one day, but aren't right now. So now I think we're going to do some questions, Jeff. Yes, we are. And I wrote down a few that we had. If anybody has to, wants to pop up with some more questions over there, go to the little chat button at the bottom of the screen. Go to the chat and click on for everyone and then ask the questions. But I'll give you one here, Jeff. Um, John Rose and Cole wanted to know, what is your favorite cocktail, your least favorite cocktail, and how do you make that favorite one? I'm guessing they mean my favorite cocktail that I like. Yeah, your yeah, favorite. I, so my favorite cocktail is a cucumber uh, Meyer lemon kamikaze. It's, uh, it's a cucumber vodka made by Square One, which is uh, located here in Novato. I put a little bit of Cointreau in it and a little bit of fresh squeezed Meyer lemon juice. It has to be Meyer lemon juice. Meyer lemons are only available uh, uh, outside of the summer months, but they're fabulous. They have kind of an orangey flavor. It's one of the best drinks I've ever had in my life. Refreshing, delicious, and, and simple. So the second part of that question was, what's my least what's favorite? What's your least favorite one to make? Uh, well, I, I, I will put that together with two things. My, the, the drink, I think the worst drink in the world is the mint julep. And let me explain why. Because it doesn't work. Mint and whiskey don't go together. If there was, there would be 8 million mint whiskeys out there. 
but there are none. There's apple whiskey, there's cinnamon whiskey, there's vanilla whiskey, there's cherry whiskey, but there isn't mint whiskey. And the problem is, it's just not a very good drink. It's got a long pedigree and a, and a long history, but taste-wise, it doesn't work. It's also kind of hard to make because you've got to kind of muddle it up. And like I said, with the mojito earlier, you don't need to do all of that. But with a mint julep, you have to, and then you end up with this very mediocre drink. So that's what I'd say my favorite drink to make and uh, my least favorite drink to both drink and to make. Okay. How about this one? You on the, When you made the old fashioned, you used two bitters. One was orange bitter. What was the other one? Jessica missed it. The other one's aromatic. So oh, essentially, aromatic. this is their version of Angostura. You could use any orange bitters and any uh, 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 aromatic bitters. You could use, uh, uh, Angostura makes both of these. Almost every, uh, uh, there, there's probably 100 bitters companies now, at least. There's at least 12 in, in Sonoma County alone. So you can mix and match them. Right, but for a classic old fashioned, you kind of want to get a little bit of that orange rindy flavor plus that original bitters flavor. So that's why I, for this drink, I use both. But you could use just one. You could use you could use the orange. You could use the this one by itself. You could use cardamom. You could use ginger. All of it's going to turn out pretty good. There's just going to be different flavor profiles. Great, great. Hey, Kim, uh, wanted what, to know what is what is I Hansen this, double barrel? Say it. Kim wanted to know, what does Hanson double barrel mean? So this is double barrel whiskey, which means it's aged in two different barrels. So most scotch is aged, aged in old, and used whiskey barrels. People don't know that. So this, uh, this is actually using a sherry barrel and a whiskey barrel. So this gives it, this is made like a Japanese whiskey. It's an American whiskey, but it's made in a Japanese style. And that makes it a little more approachable, a little easier to drink. And it, it's, it's quite delicious. The two barrels is akin to, like Balvini does double wood, um, there's a couple of, uh, most scotch producers use multiple barrelings in the thing. American whiskey is just jumping onto that bandwagon now. And uh, it's a good thing because it adds a, a dose of flavor that you can't get from a burned uh, whiskey barrel. Because remember, burning an American whiskey barrel doesn't make it better. It was just a trick to keep an industry here in the United States by, by creating a one-use barrel that had to be made here. So it's not necessarily designed to make a good product. It's designed to create an industry that generates tax revenue. So with liquor, a lot of the things break down to tax revenue. Richard wants to know, what spirits do you recommend for a uh, home bar? Uh, well, you can get, it depends. I mean, you can go crazy. I mean, I have, I have probably $10,000 worth of liquor in my house, right? And, and just because I collected over the years and some of the stuff has gone through the roof. But a, a simple whiskey, I mean, whatever your favorite whiskey is, I typically keep a, a blended whiskey around because blended whiskey appeals to everybody, where single malt doesn't. Right, so you could, you, I mean, it depends on cost. I would keep a, a simple blend of whiskey, some vodka, some tequila, some gin, uh, and triple sec, and you can make probably a thousand drinks with just those, right? So you can go crazy, but you don't want to start investing a lot in, in mixers because a lot of those bottles are expensive and they tend to go bad too, where liquor, the difference between liquor, L-I-Q-U-O-R, and L-I-Q-U-E-R uh, is that liqueurs go bad, liquors don't. So if you have a liquor in a bottle that's 100 years old, it's probably going to be okay if it's been sealed. If you have a liqueur in a bottle that's 100 years old, you probably shouldn't drink. What makes a bitter a bitter? Uh, well, bitters can have uh, several different bittering agents. Wormwood is one. You might, uh, and you think, well, what is wormwood? Vermouth is, means wormwood in, a, in, in, in it's a, a, a French term, French Germanized word. So wormwood is a bittering agent. So it, it gives a bitter thing. Gentian is another one. Um, there's a couple others. Most bitters in the bottle are made with gentian, which there's actual gentian liqueur, and those can be abrasively bitter. So bitters tend to have a decent amount of sugar in them and some other uh, uh, aromatics like cinnamon and, gin, and ginger and, and things of those natures. That, that kind of soften that bittering thing. Because just straight bitter is not an appealing thing. All cocktails are either a combination of bitter and sweet or sweet and sour. And so if you don't have that imbalance, the, whatever drink you make is not gonna taste good. How about, do you have a recommendation for a low alcohol rum? Uh, well, rum by definition is in low alcohol. So it has to be 80 proof. But there are um, a, a, a new batch of of these, uh, they're, they're, they're wine-based products, or they're, they're based on a Japanese distillate, which is called shoju, 
which is about 40 proof, 48 proof. And some of them make a rum derivative. And I'm, I'm losing track of the name. But uh, if you just look up uh, wine-based rum, you can find those. Those are about 48 proof. They still have a decent flavor, but they don't have that kick. 80 proof is not so bad. Once you get into the 90s and above 100, no matter what it is, those things tend to be pretty unappealing because alcohol is both a, uh, a, a, a antiseptic and an analgesic, meaning that when you put it on your tongue, not only will it kill the germs on your tongue, it'll kill the taste on your tongue. So the higher the proof, the, least, the less you're going to be able to taste anything. Good. Ernie wanted to know what's the best vodka you recommend. Uh, well, in my opinion, vodka is vodka is vodka. By, by, by federal law, it has to be. It's all made up to 190 proof and then diluted down to 80. And at 190 proof, you have no flavoring. The flavoring in vodka doesn't come from the base material. It comes from what they add after that fact. So it's 60% added water. It depends on what kind of water they add. Then they can add citric acid, sugar, and, um, and um, there's one, and glycerin. And all those give it a flavor profile. For my money, I go with the um, Hansen's products. Not so much because they taste better, because I, you can argue about the subtleties of taste, but remember what you're tasting is a minute amount of additives after the fact. But because these are organic, which means that they start off with a better base material. And if you have anything that, uh, if there's any argument to be made about vodka, you want to start with a better quality base ingredient. Because trust me, those mass produced ones are not buying premium corn or premium grain. They're buying the bottom of the barrel stuff and making liquor out of it. Because if they could get top dollar for it, it'd be on the shelf in Whole Foods. I got a couple so of- either, So like I said, Square One or, 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 uh, or, or uh, Hanson's are probably my two favorite vodkas for that reason. Could you repeat the brand? Could you repeat the brand of that vodka, please? This one's Hanson. Hanson? So these guys will deliver. Do you live in Marin, you live in Marin County? Yes, yes. Uh, if you call them, they will actually deliver to your house right now, which is a, an advantage of, during this lockdown. A lot of people don't understand that, that they will do delivery. Just look up Hanson of Sonoma. Okay, thank you. Tell them Jeff, Jeff sent you. That's so a they, they place make to a go to. Stuff. They also make the whiskey that, that I used to make the old fashioned. So you can, you can create an entire bar made from Marin County products. If you use Hanson whiskey, you could use Square One or Hanson vodka. You can use the, uh, the uh, Centenados. You could use um, um, Tapatio, which is made by a family up at Sonoma. Uh, Batiste, like I said, is made in, a, in a, is, is finished here in, in Marin County. You can get um, uh, gin uh, that, that, uh, that um, 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 Square One makes a botanical. San Francisco obviously makes five or six different types of gin. Hobbs and uh, Sonoma is great. Um, what else would you need? And then triple sec, you can get a triple sec from, from Hobbs as well. So you could pretty much stock an entire Marin County bar if you wanted. They, I mean, some of them are looser affiliations than others because, for instance, uh, uh, tequila can't be make, made in the United States, has to be in Mexico. So there are a few things. And then, of course, Sammy Hagar has a rum. Uh, um, uh, Metallica makes a whiskey called uh, Blackened, um, uh, and who else? There's uh, another one too. But there's a lot of local products that are available if you want. I mean, all of them, and by and large, I will say that all of the local products that I tried out of Marin County are actually pretty good. Maybe they're not to your flavor profile because taste is subjective, right? Whatever you like, you like, and uh, you need to find what, what works for you. I will say some of them are expensive. This Hanson's uh, uh, whiskey is $100. So there are, you know, Boylan's Distillery, which is a based in Petaluma, but uses uh, some of the products from Moylan's Brewery in Nevada. Uh, makes a couple of very good whiskeys. Uh, they're a lot less expensive. Um, and like I said, these places are springing up left and right all the time. Can you recommend where to buy those in, in Nevada? Sharon's asking. Uh, again, it, uh, uh, well, Hanson's will deliver. Batiste, uh, you can probably call them. Uh, I think um, um, Vintage Wine and Spirits carries it. I know Whole Foods carries Batiste. Uh, I think Whole Foods also carries Hanson. They carry Square One for sure. Um, a lot of, you know, like I said, Vintage Wine and Spirits, um, the um, Tiburon Wine Shop, some of them have uh, uh, spirits and wine that you just can't get your hands on anywhere else. You go to places like Bevmo, and it's pretty much all mass-produced stuff. Bevmo does carry Blackened and Sammy Hagar's rum, uh, but, you know, I mean, they're, they're basically a lot of their stuff is, is just mass produced supermarket stuff. And occasionally you can find it Safeway or even um, like um, um, uh, not Long's, but the, the, the little drugstore that has a liquor store. 
and or it has liquor license. And you'd be surprised at what you can find. Costco is also another great place to get bargain liquor, not necessarily local bargain liquor, but boy, they have great prices that are hard to beat. Hey, why is a, uh, Amy's asking, hey, why is a Moscow mule served in a copper cup? Well, the funny thing about a Moscow mule is it's really just, just a, a, a high book, book, huh? but the, the cup was a, a marketing gimmick. The whole thing was a marketing gimmick in the 50s. There was a, the head of Hoopleen and the head of uh, um, um, Smirnoff were sitting in a bar in, in Los Angeles, or so the story goes. I think it was like 1953, and they said, you know, prohibition had en ended, and they had all these facilities making ginger beer, and Smirnoff was trying to bring vodka over, which was not popular. Remember, vodka didn't become a preeminent American spirit until James Bond in the 60s really popularized it with his shake and not stir and martini, right? Before that, it was gin or whiskey. That's what America drank. So they sat down and they said, you know, well, we should put these things together. And there was a waitress there who made these little copper cups. And they said, well, put it in that and it'll, it'll, it'll go like wildfire. And it did. And the funny thing is it completely went away for about 50 years or 40 years. And then all of a sudden came roaring back. And there's no advantage. That's the funny thing about a, a, a Moscow mule. There's zero advantage to having it in a copper mug because people say, oh, it makes it cooler. But copper is actually a conductor of heat. So if this was made out of copper and I held it in my hand, my body's 98.6 degrees. I'm going to transfer the heat from my body to the, to the drink in that cup much faster than if it was made out of stainless steel like this is. So in fact, the drink is actually warmer. But when you put it on your lips, you, your lips sense the, that transfer of energy and it feels cooler. It's a psychological trick. Now, it's funny, there's a company up in uh, Nevada called Cork Pops. Give me one second. And they make an insulated copper mug. So this has what I call gel insulated in between the layers. You put your Moscow Mule in this thing, and it is going to be the coldest thing you've ever had. They also make the, the famous Cork Pops wine opener, which is a little CO2, uh, looks like a, like a hypodermic needle. You stick it in a bottle, press a little air, pops the cork right out. Great for something like this. I've actually used it to open a bottle of this for this family because they couldn't get the corks out of their bottle because this is an ancient bottle. It's what, 30, 40 years old, right? So these corks tend to disintegrate, but if you use the cork popper, it's great. They got a bunch of other bar products, but the cork popper and this are my two favorites. How about, oh, here's Amy again. Where did the Bloody Mary come from? Oh, well, the Bloody Mary, and this is one of those funny stories that kind of goes along with that. That uh, Oh, by the way, I don't know if you realize that in the film, the door that the woman is walking into that looks like the bathroom door is the door I was talking about in that story. Oh. So that, that actually isn't a door. You can't open it. So the filmmaker thought that that was a better view than our actual bathroom, which is the other way. So it's always funny for me to watch that because I work in that bar and uh, to see her walking the wrong direction. Because anyone who goes that direction, I always have to say, Excuse me, the bathroom's the other way. So at any rate, um, uh, the Bloody Mary uh, supposedly was invented uh, at, at Harry's Bar in, in, uh, in, in, in Paris, which I've been to and I've done a story. There's a story, all these stories are actually in my books. So, um, but the funny thing about the, 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 the Bloody Mary is it was invented sometime in the 30s, but they kept moving the date back with these various claims to kind of get ahead of the other guy. And what they actually did is they moved the date back before tomato juice was invented. So tomato juice was invented in the mid 1930s because tomato juice isn't tomato juice. It's actually a thinned out tomato sauce. So if they were making Bloody Marys in 1929 at Harry's Bar, I don't know what they were using because there was no such thing as tomato juice at that point. So that's one of those stories where it's actually uh, probably came together as a course of different, uh, uh, several different places just like the margarita. No one person invented the margarita. In Latin, in Latin American countries, they always mix the indigenous spirit with sugar and lime. That's what they all do. And uh, you know, in the case of the margarita, they named it after what the kind of drink it is, a daisy. Margarita means daisy. A daisy is a type of drink of which the margarita is one. So there's, you know, people can try and take credit for things, but it's rare to be able to put your finger on a time and a place when someone actually did it. That's why that Tequila Sunrise story was such a, such an amazing thing to find is I could pinpoint an exact time in history with an exact person who did something like that. That was, that's pretty cool. How about, let's see, 
who asked you this? George did. Um, I don't know if I can say this right. It's A P E R O L. Spritzer. You got it in Italy. Is there anything equal made locally? Uh, well, there's a lot of Amaros made locally, and uh, there's a lot of, excuse me, uh, Aperol is a type of Amaro, and uh, you can use a, a variety of different things. There's not really one locally that, that I think is, is similar to Aperol. There's a couple imported by Tempest Fugit uh, up in Petaluma, and so they do a, uh, uh, they do a, um, uh, what is it called, a, um, um, uh, Labion d'Or, which is one that works for them. Again, Tempus Fugit, T-E-M-P-U-S-F-U-I-G-I-T. -E and they've got a couple. And the other one is God, oh, um, Grand Classico, which works pretty well. So really, it's just uh, uh, the Amaro, soda water, and, and, and some Prosecco. And it's fabulous. I have a funny story about that. Now, I was in Rome uh, about two years ago. And we went to the American bar to taste some Amaros, which after all is one. Right and bitters, by the way, are amaro. Amaro means bitter, right? So bitters, amaro, fernet, all in the same category. But uh, when we walked up to the American bar there, my friend says to me, "Is that Joanne Weir over there?" And I said, "That no, Joanne Weir owns Copita and Sausalito." I said, "No, it's not possible." And they said, "Why don't you go ask?" I don't want to go bother so, you know someone who's who's uh, who's uh, you know has some celebrity. So they end up sitting us right next to her. So it was Joanne Weir, and we sat in that bar in Rome and drank Aperol spritzes. It was one of the most fabulous experiences I've ever had. As I always tell Joanne now, we'll always have Rome. How about, Paul wants to know, was Irish coffee really invented in Buena Vista? No, no, Irish coffee was invented in Dublin for American tourists, not for the Irish. The Irish don't drink Irish coffees. Uh, the Irish also don't drink, they don't, don't speak Gaelic, they speak Irish. Just FYI, a lot of people don't get that. I'm actually Irish, uh, uh, Scots, uh, Irish Scots, actually, as I like to say. But w the one thing that the, the Buena Vista did do is greatly popularize the Irish coffee. They are definitely the largest producer of Irish coffees in the world. I used to work for the guy who now owns it. And I remember when he took over, he made one tiny change that raised a million dollars of extra revenue for that restaurant. And that one change was he raised the cost of the Irish coffee one dollar, and, and that tells you they make a million Irish coffees a year, which is hard to believe. So Con Cannon is an Irish family that makes um, uh, wine here in California. California, they actually have uh, their 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 families also in Ireland. They transport their petite Syrah barrels there and age Irish whiskey in that, and then ship it back. And that's one of those things that has kind of a local slant. It's not exactly local, but it definitely has a local land, slant. That's called Concanon Irish whiskey. It's quite good. Tom wants to know what is your favorite liqueur? Uh, my favorite liqueur in the world is uh, probably Grand Marnier. So I think it's pretty versatile. I use it a lot to make drinks. I particularly love it in, in margaritas. Um, I do like Sambucas. Uh, the one I'm not a huge fan of, uh, of high proof uh, liqueurs. So things like absinthe and uh, chartreuse, not a, not a huge fan. I know how to use them. I know what their qualities are and what people want in them. But for myself, I, I rarely, really, really drink them myself. Jessica and Melissa are asking you, for a perfect martini, is it vermouth, yes or no? Gin or vodka? Uh, well, well, so a perfect, so there might be several different things you're asking there. A perfect Manhattan is a combination of sweet and dry vermouth in, with whiskey. So a perfect martini can also be that. And uh, that's actually not a bad drink. But if you mean to make an actual martini perfectly, that's a different thing. That's one of those things you'd want to be careful ordering that from a bartender. Because if you said perfect martini, if he didn't ask, you probably are going to get something with both sweet and dry vermouth. So having said that, uh, typically, I don't care for dry vermouth. Most of it's oxidized and very inexpensive. I always say, if you're going to spend $30 on a bottle of vodka, why on earth would you want to flavor it with an $8 bottle of cheap wine, right? Which is what vermouth is. However, that has changed the last couple of years. So there's a company out of uh, Napa called Lo-Fi, which makes an excellent dry vermouth. So they make one. You can also substitute Bianco vermouth, which is actually, a, uh, remember, red vermouth is just white vermouth that's been colored. But if you use Bianco vermouth, you get the clarity of the vermouth and you get this wonderful aromatic flavor that's not that, because remember, 
dry vermouth is oxidized. And in regular table wine, oxidized is considered flawed or spoiled. So why that a flavor profile exists like that, I'm not quite sure. But again, having said that, Lo-Fi makes a great dry vermouth. Uh, and uh, uh, Carpano just released the dry vermouth. That's okay, it's a little more expensive. But if I were you, I'd get the lo-fi. It's, it's, it's a, a lot fresher tasting. Vaya too, which is these guys, makes a whisper dry. And Vaya is owned by um, Michael Dello, who used to own the Lark Creek Inn and now owns one market in San Francisco. This was a combination project between him and Quadius, uh, Quadi Wines way back in, in, the in the 90s that kind of faded because no one was drinking vermouth then. Now that it's all the rage, uh, they make a couple of these, they make a whisper dry, they make a regular dry, and they make a sweet. I don't care for the sweet, it has kind of an odd flavor, but these are quite good. Remember with vermouth, it is wine. If you're gonna open it, put it in the fridge when you're done. Don't freeze it, it'll freeze solid, but don't put it uh, on your shelf. Refrigerate it, just like you would any table wine. So red and white vermouth are both dry. No, no, no. Uh, so, so what's a sweet vermouth? So, so red and white vermouth are essentially the same product but okay. red vermouth has caramel coloring added to it. Dry vermouth is a different product, has an oxidized flavor, and not quite the freshness of, of, of either sweet or Bianco vermouth. So like I said, I don't particularly care for its flavor profile because most, for, for the one reason it's oxidized on purpose, and secondly, almost nobody refrigerates it, and it all goes back. So any bar you walk into, if their, if their vermouth is in the well, and it's dry vermouth, and it's been sitting there for two months, would you leave a bottle of white wine sitting open on the shelf for two months and then expect it to be any good? I don't think you would, but bars do it every single day, and high-end bars, too. Well, I'm going to make this the last one, just because I, got, I bet Kathy is trying to trick me. Okay. Is Pappy Van Winkle worth the price? Uh, no. Oh, so it's real. Okay. <laughs> So the thing about hey, Pappy Van Winkle is it's what's called a weeded whiskey, which means that uh, bourbon is made with uh, over 51% corn. That's what makes bourbon bourbon. But what Maker's Mark found out in the 50s is that if you use wheat, uh, so, so, so you make it with 51% corn, but then you flavor it with rye. The flavoring agent in almost all bourbon is rye, not the, bur not the corn, but the rye. Even though it's less than 51%, that's where the flavor is coming from. So what Maker's Mark discovered is that they used wheat instead of rye, they ended up with a better tasting, or at least in their opinion, softer tasting uh, whiskey, which was true. Now what Pappy realized, uh, what those guys realized, is if you use both rye and wheat, you end up with a much mellower flavor profile. That's wonderful. And uh, their whiskey is good, but you can get like Old Weller, W-E-L-L-E-R, uh, is fabulous. There's a wheat whiskey made up in Napa. I can't think of their name right now. That's also quite good. And I mean, Pappy is just ridiculously expensive. It's scarcity. They, it's the same thing as Pliny the Elder, that for, you know, Pliny the Elder beer <laughs> became incredibly popular. But for, the, for, for about a year of its peak of popularity, they didn't even make it. They were renovating their brewery and contracted it out. So, you know, people get caught up with, with that kind of thing, especially in the liquor industry, and that's what fuels a lot of it. You should be able to get an excellent, and I mean excellent whiskey, for 40 to $50. I mean, really good. And there's a lot of them available. Don't steer away from blends. They're quite good. Uh, but find, uh, you know, find wheat whiskeys, find high rye whiskeys, uh, and stay away from high proof whiskey. That's my recommendation. House. Huh? I'll just go to Kathy's. Well, it depends on what your end goal is. <laughs> Jeff, I've got to thank you so much for, for helping us put this together. I think oh, I uh, we had a lot of happy viewers. Don't forget to book Push that on book. Amazon. Where do we get it? Amazon? You can get them on Amazon, yeah. All right. So, and then, like, uh, hopefully, once this is all done, we'll do one of these in person. In we'll line, be able yeah. to all share a cocktail. It'll be fabulous. It, we've got that whole good bar there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Once again, um, if you have more questions, you can send them to me at info at marinhistory.org. Please check out our website. Consider becoming a member to keep us going here. And I can't think of anything else. I want to thank everyone for um, checking us out. I thank want you. everyone to know that we've recorded the session today. And it will be available in about two days. And we're going to figure out how to get it to you. So keep looking at the web, web page, Marin History Museum. 
Um, and we had about 150 to 160 people log on today. And I think it's mostly because of you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> we, they love history. Don't, don't, don't diminish it. <laughs> That's right. Well, trust me, if there were free drinks involved, we'd have twice that many. <laughs> yeah. Right. Beautiful cars in your background, by the way. Thank you, Jeff. I, I understand you have a Porsche as well. Yeah, I have a 968 convertible. I just actually finished all of the, in this three month period, finished all the little detail work. It looks beautiful. Oh. So. My first car was a 1968 912. Oh boy. You know how much that car's worth now? I know. I know. <laughs> you don't want to know who I sold it to. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye, you guys. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks.